Okay, this is the uh, getting to know you God uh, class. And this is lesson number five in this uh, brief series, the final lesson in this particular series. And the title of this lesson is The God Who Is Able. The God Who Is Able. Now, if you, I, I want to go back to the beginning here, just to kind of review a little bit. If you remember the beginning lesson, the purpose for this particular series was to help us get a better grip or feeling about God and who He really is, because there are a lot of misconceptions, people laboring under different types of ideas which are not quite accurate uh, about God. And when you do this, you lessen your ability to know who He is and lessening your ability to know who God is lessens the joy and lessens the, uh, the satisfaction that, uh, that you uh, can um, attain in your personal uh, faith. So the point was to not just get head knowledge or religious knowledge, you know, religious rules, theological ideas or, or doctrines um, uh, about God, uh, but getting to know God from, uh, from your belly, you know, from, your, from your guts, so that He can be real to you. Knowing God on an emotional level. Now there's something, you know, um, we have to be careful, we can't just know God on an emotional, uh, emotional level, that can be dangerous. Uh, but it is good to know Him from that level, um, along with understanding Him from an intellectual level. So we're, we're trying to get a, um, a kind of get a balance here about our knowledge of, uh, of God. So with this in mind, let's review some of the aspects of His character and being that we've talked about in the, in the uh, previous lessons. First of all, we said God is a spirit, uh, but He uses male and female as well as material objects to reveal Himself to us. You know, we say He, God, He did this and He did that, but we understand He's not a male because we've read passages where God is referred to as female, right? Um, the most accurate reflection comes in the person of Jesus. We learned that. We also learn that the best way of knowing Him is to imitate Him. And the way to imitate Him is to separate ourselves often for spiritual things like prayer and worship, uh, the service in the name of God, in the name of uh, Christ. Uh, separate ourselves uh, to study and to learn, to read, to meditate on His word. Uh, if you, if you want to know God, you have to go where He is. And He's in all those things. He is there when you are praying. He is there um, at worship. He is there when you're serving. He is there when you're studying. So if you want to know Him, you want to imitate Him, you have to go where He is at. And also we have to separate ourselves from the impurities of this world, impurities of thought, impurities of word and deed. This is how to get to know, uh, this is how to get to know God. Uh, then a couple of weeks ago we studied Psalm 139 and we saw that our relationship with God is a two-way street. Uh, he knows us inside out and He wants us to know Him as well. So it isn't that our God is a mysterious God, you know, unwilling to allow Himself to be known you know, high above. And our God wants to know us personally, does know us personally, but He wants us also to know Him personally, because therein lies our joy. Our joy, is spiritual joy, is based on the idea that we know God more and more and more and more, more deeply uh, as we grow in Christ. We get to know God, and the knowing of God is what uh, provokes the joy in us and the peace in us and the happiness uh, uh, in us. And then finally, we learned that uh, we learned three important things about God, especially when we're in trouble. So we learned that God is sometimes silent, but He's never absent. So just because our prayers at times are not answered does not mean that they're not heard. Uh, just because God doesn't provide us with a reasonable explanation for the troubles we suffer doesn't mean there isn't one doesn't mean that one day at some particular moment we'll understand why something happened. There's no guarantee of it, but it doesn't mean that it isn't there. Let's not mistake God's silence for a lack of love or caring. 
Just because God doesn't answer your prayer doesn't mean He doesn't love you. Uh, we also said that when we're in trouble, we need to let God know about the trouble. Sometimes we need to get the herd out before we can go on with our, with our lives. And we understood that God encourages us to pour out our hearts and souls before Him in order to relieve us of worry and, uh, and pain. Uh, he doesn't say that He'll answer. The promise is that He'll listen. And that's very comforting, that He listens, that He hears what I'm, what I'm saying, that he, he is aware of my condition. And then we said that God has His purposes in life. In other words, God uses all things, good and bad, in our lives for His own purpose, and His own purpose is good. You know, God doesn't throw anything away. He uses everything. He uses events in our lives, but not always to serve us, and not always to serve us now. You know, we're temporal beings. We live a certain amount of time. There's a beginning and a pretty quick end. You know? And so we want to see things working out in our lives so that we can see the beginning and the end. But sometimes something begins at one point in our lives and the ending will only be in another life after we're gone. Why? Because it's serving God's purpose, not our purpose. So it's not so much God has a plan for my life. I hear people say that all the time. God has a plan for my life. It's not so much God has a plan for my life, but rather God has His plan and my life fits into His plan. That's a little more accurate. And if I give my life to Him, that plan will benefit me eventually, if not here in heaven if not here and now, somewhere down the line. Because God may use my life, an event in my life, something. He may use my ministry, my marriage, my suffering. He may use that, but He may not use it for me. He may use it in the service of someone else that I don't even know. You know, uh, uh, Gutenberg, you know, the, inventor, the inventor of movable type, you know, and the first, we all know, well, Gutenberg, you know, the first the uh, Bible was printed on his press, you know, and so on and so forth. And, and a small historical fact that not a lot of people know is that Gutenberg eventually uh, had his presses seized because he couldn't pay for them. <laughs> he went bankrupt. He went to jail. He died in jail, in debtor's prison. Imagine his thinking, wait a minute, no, I, you know, I went into debt to get the printing thing and I'm the one that printed the first Bible and da 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 and I'm in jail? God, what's up with that? And yet, look where we are today. Look how many millions and millions of Bibles, millions and millions of books about Jesus, about the faith and you know, the impact that printing has had on our faith. Surely he did not, Gutenberg did not see all of this. And certainly from his prison cell he couldn't imagine. You know? and why didn't God free him? Why didn't God let him go? He had done a good thing. So you see, uh, our life, our suffering doesn't always serve us. Sometimes it serves someone else further down the line. And we need to remember that and have faith. That's why we walk by faith, not by sight. So in today's lesson, I'd like to add one more final thought about God and His relationship with us when we're in trouble. And that is, our God, our God is able. We've said a lot of things about God. He's this, He's that, you know, He listens. Our God is able. Do you know why sometimes our prayers are not effective? Why sometimes we stay in the same fear, the same mess, the same sin, month in and month out? There's a reason for that. A lot of times we know about God, but we don't believe what we know about God. <laughs> you know, we, uh, we know all the things. Yeah, yeah, I heard it, I've heard it, I know. I, you know people say, yeah, I know about God, you don't tell me, I've, I've learned. I grew up in the church. You know. We know about God, but we don't believe the things that we know about God. There's a big difference. 
A good example of this is in the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 11, where the Israelites were complaining about their diet of manna, and they longed for the food that they had you know, back in Egypt, especially meat. And so Moses pleads with the Lord, knowing that the Lord can do something. So if we go to that passage, we read in verse 19 and 20, Numbers 11, 19 and 20, he says, you will not eat it for just one or two days. You will not eat it for just five, 10 or 20 days. Instead, you will eat it for a whole month. You will eat it until it comes out of your noses. You will eat it until you hate it. The Lord is among you, but you have turned your back on Him. You have cried out while He was listening. You have said, why did we ever leave Egypt? So God tells Moses that He's going to supply them with meat but not just for one meal, he's going to give it to them every day for a month. So notice Moses' response in verse 21 and 22. But Moses said to the Lord, here I am among 600,000 men on the march, and you say, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month. Would they have enough if flocks and herds were killed for them? Would they have enough even if all the fish in the ocean were caught for them? So Moses' response here demonstrates that he knew God. I mean, he was talking to him. <laughs> he was talking. He knew he was talking to God. And he knew that God was talking to him. But Moses didn't really believe what he knew about God. So Moses acknowledged elsewhere that God was all-powerful and he worshiped Him as such. But now that God said what He would do, Moses doubted. He doubted. So look at God's answer in verse 23. The Lord answered Moses, Am I not strong enough? Now you will see whether what I say will come true for you. So God turns around and He challenges Moses to believe what he knew about God. You know, you've been talking to me and you believe that I am who I am and you've seen the miracles and so on and so forth. Let me show you that I can do what I say I can do. So you know, we spend a lifetime storing up information about God. You know, we go to Sunday school, Bible classes, retreats, Bible reading, church attendance. We hear thousands, thousands literally, if you grow up in the church and you're, you know, you're a regular member, I mean regular in the sense that you attend uh, regularly, you'll hear thousands of sermons and you'll be in you know, class, all kinds of classes, on all, always about the Bible, always related to God in some way or another, to Jesus. All, all, all of that stuff. But when trouble comes, we refuse to believe what we have learned about this God that we say we know so well. And the result is that we pray with knowledge that God hears, but without the conviction that He can and He will do something. And the main issue with He will do something a lot of times is we only count it legitimate if He does what we have asked Him to do for us. And sometimes miss the things that He does just because it's not what we wanted. So God, you know, God is able if we are willing. Mike Cope, in his book, One Holy Hunger, I've mentioned this book in other uh, lessons, a lot of this material comes from this wonderful book, One Holy Hunger. He says that the answer to this dilemma of knowledge and faith is to understand that God is able if we are willing. In other words, He provides the power if we provide the willingness to believe. And sometimes you know, that belief is like that father whose son was you know, possessed and being thrown to the ground and and he said to Jesus, I believe, but help my disbelief. He acknowledged, he had faith, but it was weak. Uh, the great and wonderful, merciful thing about God is that God, you know, He'll accept even weak faith. 
a beginner's faith, a tentative faith, a step forward, maybe not 10 steps, but one step. I'll take one step forward. So God will provide the power if we provide the willingness to believe. I'm willing to believe, Lord. And with every increment of faith, God reveals another measure of His power in our lives. That's the problem. We, we want Him, you know, it's like, okay, God, you go first. <laughs> you, you go first, you show me. Well, wasn't that the attitude of the Jews? Show us a sign, give us, you know, show us something, and then we'll believe. Well, then, is it belief then? Well, no, that's walking by sight. Our whole lives, our whole Christian lives, the one thing that God is trying to teach us is to walk by faith. It's the, it's the, it's the only, everything boils down, I, I've said to our children, when we talk about issues of faith and issues of you know, our Christian lives and so on and so forth, around the dinner table, so on and so forth, when conversation kind of tends to go in that direction, I've said to them many times, listen, try to remember, it's always about faith. Stuff that's going on in your life, it's always about faith, always. Will I have faith to do this thing? Will I have faith to not do this thing? Will I take a step of faith you know, when I'm not sure? It's always about our faith because that's the thing that God is trying to teach us all the time, to walk by faith. So Paul the Apostle, he talks about this connection in Ephesians 1, uh, verse 18 and 19, he says, I pray that you may understand more clearly. Then you will know the hope God has chosen you to receive. You will know that what God will give, uh, that God will give His holy people is rich and glorious. And you will know God's great power. It can't be compared with anything else. His power works for us who believe. It works for us who believe. That's always the, the bottom line. So Paul is saying the blessings that await those who are Christians, well, what are the blessings that await those who are Christians? Well, he's described them in, you know, previously. The, the blessings that, are, that we're awaiting, a resurrection from the dead. The glorification of our bodies, meaning we get the new body. You know, this body here, this flesh and blood body, it's designed to exist in this world. You know, we have air and oxygen, we eat food, you know, blah, 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 we need water, we need exercise. You know, our body is designed to exist in this material dimension. The glorified body is designed to live in the purely spiritual dimension. Another body is required there. You know, we, we see movies, you know, The Martian or you know, movies about spaceships, what happens? They leave Earth, they leave this dimension, they go into outer space. They need a different kind of suit to enable them to exist there. Well, we need a different kind of suit, a different kind of body in order to exist in the spiritual dimension. The Bible calls that body, quote, you know, this is the flesh and blood body. The Bible calls the body for the spiritual dimension the glorified body. The glorified body. So that's, that's another of the things we're anticipating. Resurrection, you know, end of death, the glorified body, and then exaltation. Resurrection, glorification, exaltation. What's the exaltation? Well, we will be with God at the right hand with Christ. We'll participate in the Trinity, in the Godhead. We become grafted to that in some way. We can't even get our brain around that idea. That's what's awaiting us. So that's, that's one thing, the blessings that await, but listen to what else he says. He says, the power that is available to guarantee these blessings is what? Faith. We, we cannot obtain these blessings through good works, through you know, extreme knowledge, you, you memorize the Bible from beginning to end, that task, that feat doesn't guarantee these blessings. What guarantees these blessings is faith. Why do you think God is continually training us to believe? Because 
Faith is the only way to access the things that He's promised us, that's why. Note that at the end of uh, verse 19, He says that these, uh, these things, these revelations are made to those who believe. You get to understand, you get to see, you get to grasp the resurrection, the nature of the glorified body, the experience of that exaltation. You begin to taste that, begin to see that, begin to understand that through faith. This is why people who don't believe in God don't see Him. He's hidden from them because of disbelief. Have you ever tried to share your faith with someone who's absolutely clueless about God, doesn't want to know about God, you know, it just it totally focused in this world and nothing else, and you begin to share your faith, it's as if the words coming out of your mouth are nonsense. Even to yourself you're going, <laughs> you know, it's like throwing sand against the wall, nothing sticks. Why? because they not only don't believe, they just don't want to believe, period. What is so plain to believers escapes their notice, not believers, but unbelievers, because they either are ignorant altogether or they refuse to believe what they do know. They know some stuff about God, oh Christmas, you know, this and that, but they don't, you know, they don't believe what they know. So regardless of the reason why they reject faith, the net result is always the same. Blindness, they don't get it. They just don't get it. But the opposite is also true. If we're willing to believe what it is that we know about God, that belief will translate into greater knowledge, which will in turn produce greater faith which in turn will produce greater insight, which in turn will, you know, it's like a, your faith gets stronger and as your faith gets stronger, you begin to know God and understand these things more deeply, more richly, and because of that, your faith is strengthened and because your faith is strengthened, you can go deeper and deeper and deeper. There's no end to it. Now in this world, no end to it is rather discouraging. But in the knowledge of God, no end to it is an actual wonderful thing. You mean there's no end to this wonder? There's no end to this joy? There's no end to how much I can know? How much I can take in? I tend to think the glorious body, one of the things about it is that it enables us to be present and to begin to take in God without limits. I've said this to you before. Have you ever been, quote, in the spirit? You're praying or you're reading or something and it's like, oh man, it's like the word is so clear. I can, I can, I so get it. It's so great. You know, or you're praying and it's, it's marvelous. It's wonderful. You know, you're in sports, I say you're in the zone. Well, you know, spiritually you're in the zone, you know, and what happens? Well, you got to go to the bathroom. Your bladder calls. Poof. There goes the zone. There goes the or the doorbell rings, or your phone goes off, or the kid comes in and says, Mommy, you know, Johnny hit me. You know what I'm saying? In this physical body, there's just so much we can... The whole point of monasticism was to try to eliminate all of these other things so people could focus completely on you know, meditating, so on and so forth. So the net result of all of this will be not only a greater knowledge, but the blessings that come with the greater knowledge of God. And the blessings that come with the greater knowledge of God. Peace, confidence, joy, power, love, hope, all those things. <clears throat> now when we read the Bible, and especially those passages where God is doing great things, it seems that He's always doing something but for somebody else. And I think our a problem is that we sometimes lack the willingness to believe that this great, all-powerful, all-knowing God will do something for me, just little old me. In order to build both our knowledge and our faith, I want to share with you two things that God can do, and most especially will do for you, for me. Number one, He can deal with anything you bring Him. He can deal with anything you bring him. I tell people, you know, they come for counseling and so on and so forth. 
If you've been a minister for any length of time, for me, you know, 38 years, that's a long time to do one, the same thing. And people come with counseling and they're for a particular thing and they're nervous at the beginning. You know, I mean, they're going to share their lives, their secret life, their troubled life with someone, well, you know, they know kind of, you know. How will I react? The preacher, oh my goodness, you know, I don't want to shock him, you know. And I tell him from the beginning, there's nothing you can tell me that I have not already heard and seen. What do you think you can tell? You're a pedophile? Psh, been there, seen that, heard that, no people. You killed somebody? Sure. I've been in jail talking to you know, double murderer. You beat your wife. You consume porn. You're an alcoholic. You're a druggie. Whatever. whatever. It doesn't matter. You can't tell me anything I haven't heard live from somebody else. So go ahead. Shoot. I won't be shocked. I won't be disgusted. I won't think ill of you. Well, God is like this, I mean, to an nth degree. He can deal with anything that you bring Him. Your hopes, your fears, your illness, your failures, your sins, your doubts, your plans, your family, your joys, your activities, your loneliness, whatever. Think back over all that you know about God. Okay. Was there ever a person or situation where God did not answer or did not know how to answer? So what makes your problem so special? None of the people God dealt with ever expected Him to answer their prayer the way that He did. You know, Moses wanted to lead an insurrection, right? I'm your leader. You know, he breaks up a fight, he kills one of the Egyptians. You know, I'll, I'm your leader, I'm ready, I'm educated, I've got position, I'm going to be the leader of my people, my people are down, set my people free, he's ready to do. What happens? <laughs> God sends him into the desert for 40 years to tend sheep. <laughs> Paul, you know, he wanted to preach the gospel to the, the whole world. Talk about a dynamic guy. Brilliant, zealous, courageous, fearless. I'm ready, Lord. You know, I'm going to go to China. I'm going to the, no, no, I want you to go west. He says, west, sure. The empire, sure. I'm game. Rome, Spain, and beyond. So what does God do? He puts him in jail <laughs> for two years in a jail for two years, and then even more years after that, imprisonment. That wasn't part of his plan. His plan was, man, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get out there and preach the gospel. I'm going to do it. I wonder what his thought was when he was you know, chained uh, this, this uh, summer. Uh, I, I, you know, we, I went to uh, Switzerland to, uh, to do a, a, a seminar in French there. And we had a little you know, vacation time and we visited a castle that was like a thousand years old. It was built in like 800 or 900, very, you know, in Europe, a lot of ancient things. And we visited the dungeons in the castle underneath, all rock and stone and everything. And there in the ground was a, a spike with, a, you know, with, a, with a, ch a chain on it. And the guide was telling us, this is where such and such a person was chained for six years. And I mean, talk about damp. I mean, there were just you know, cutouts in the wall. You know what I'm saying? The, 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 the lake was there, Lake Geneva was there. And <laughs> six years chained to a pillar. He didn't die, this guy. Eventually he was freed and did other things. And I'm thinking, this is the kind of thing that Paul suffered. You know, we're always thinking prison. We're thinking you know, McAllister. We're thinking you know, prison where the guys have a room, it's air conditioned, they got closed circuit TV, they got a radio, they got a bunk bed. You know, I mean, it's not great. You know. But Paul was chained to a pillar in a dungeon for a couple of years with a bucket in the corner for his business. I mean, think about that. 
this was not exactly the worldwide evangelism plan that he was thinking about. And yet while he was in jail, he wrote the prison epistles. While he was in jail, he wrote things down. Where would we be without 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 1st, 2nd Timothy? Where would we be without Titus, without uh, Philemon? Where would we be? First, uh, where would we be without the book of Romans? Where would we be? So we're not always sure the way our life works out. But do any of us doubt that God knew and knows what He's doing? That God cares or that He's not sure of succeeding in His overall plan? That's always the problem. It's because His plan is interfering with our plan, so there must be something wrong. But even if His method is not our method, His timing not our timing, do we doubt His plans better than our plan? So let's keep on believing even when our prayers are not answered in the way we wanted and at the time we expect. Think about it. Perhaps what God wants is your faith and your continued prayers in the face of insurmountable odds and maybe that in itself will accomplish His purpose without your knowledge. Have you ever thought that maybe the only thing He wants to accomplish in your life is to make your faith strong and your prayer life strong, period, that's it. So that in the middle of your prayers and, and the struggle of your faith to remain strong, He just cuts your life off right there, boom. But wait a minute, God, you're, you're making me die here. I thought there was going to be an ending over here where there would be a happy ending and everything, you know, like the conclusion after the last commercial of a TV show, they have the last commercial and then the conclusion. Oh, that's why he shot the guy and uh, he was a mole. Oh, I get it. In the middle of our struggle, in the middle of our fighting to remain faithful, we die. Have you ever thought the only thing that God was wanting was you to struggle in prayer and remain faithful? That that was the end game? In the end, it's His will that counts, not ours. Our will counts for nothing. So here's what God is able to do. He can deal with anything you bring Him, anything. Number two, there's only two, He can save you. He can save you. You know, in baseball, the relief pitcher is called the saver, right? And when he wins the game, he's got so many saves. The relief pitcher's got so many saves. Because he's the one who will try to you know, maintain the lead or hold on so the batters can score some more runs. If the team is too far behind, however, they won't bother using their best relief pitcher. They'll save him for another day. Well, our God is the ultimate reliever. We are never too far behind in the game of life for him to be called in to win for us. The only thing that keeps Him out of play is our refusal to call on Him by faith. Faith to believe not just that He'll play, but faith to believe that He'll win for us. But remember, He'll win on His terms, not our terms. I want to be healthy all my life and have everything go okay and then be 95 years old, healthy 95 years old, and then go to sleep in my nice comfortable bed and then wake up and be in heaven. That's pretty much the way, right? Isn't that what we want? I want to be 95 and healthy, go to sleep, die, and wake up in heaven. That's it. That's my, that's my, you know, that's my scenario. That's what I want. Is that what happens? No. No, no, because if you live much beyond 85, 90, you're falling down a lot, you're hurting yourself a lot, stuff doesn't work anymore. You're probably not in your own bed. You probably wouldn't even know your own bed if you were in it. That's how it goes. But no one thing, no matter what happens in our physical life, what the process of our demise is, God can save you. God will save you. So in the last couple of weeks, you know, we've learned a lot of things about God in order to know Him better. 
If you remember anything about Him, remember He is able if we are willing. And the question is, are we willing to believe that God is able to forgive us any sin we've ever committed? Are we willing to believe that God is able to take us back even if we've denied Him and been unfaithful? Are we willing to believe that God is able to comfort us, to give us direction, to hold our hands steady, or to do what it takes to help us through one more day of our suffering, of our disappointments? If you're willing to believe, then God is able to do these and greater things for, for all of us. And I leave us with Luke 8.50. He says, hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe and she will be healed. Speaking of his little girl who had passed. Don't be afraid. Amazing thing in the New Testament, how many times Jesus says, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. We're always so afraid. Don't be afraid, he says, just belief. Believe in the God who is there and who is able to save us if we're willing. Okay, so that's our lesson, our final lesson in the series, number five. We are dismissed. Thank you for your attention.